All right, welcome back, everybody. We're really getting towards the end of the semester here. We have three lectures to go. One of them is obviously today. And then next week, we have a lecture on Monday and Wednesday, and that's it. During these next three lectures, we are going to go over some new content, and that content is going to appear on the final exam. So these are not just throwaways. Um, but next week, uh, just so you have a heads up, we don't have any official lab meetings, OK? That is, you're not required to come into lab, and there's no credit for coming into lab. Okay. However, I am going to be in the lab at the normal times if you just want to come in, study, and ask me questions. But again, this is just purely optional. Think of it as like an optional review session for the final exam. All right, so come in if you feel like it would be useful for you, but you don't have to. Make sense? So that's uh, what's coming up. Also, we have homework 16. That's going to be due next Wednesday. Okay? And then test corrections. Uh, I'm passing back the tests, or I already did at the beginning of class. If you didn't get your test back because you came in late, get it at the end of class. But test corrections will be due next Monday. Okay? So, obviously, we need to talk about the final exam coming up as well. It's exactly two weeks away. The final is going to be on Wednesday, May 18th. Now, remember, Final exam time slots do not exactly match up with the time slot of our lecture, okay? So the final exam time slot that we've been given is on Wednesday, May 18th from 2.15 to 4.45 p.m. in this room, okay? That's when we're coming in for the final. Like I said, the final is cumulative, so anything covered throughout the semester is fair game. However, uh, because we are going to cover some new stuff after test three, that's going to be emphasized a little bit more on the final exam. So that material, by the way, is chapter 16 of our textbook, which is Maxwell's equations, which is what we're going to start today. Um, so to give you a sense of how much this will be emphasized, expect on the exam itself between 8 and 10 questions total. And then expect that between 2 and 3 of those questions are going to be about this new material, uh, Maxwell's equations. Okay. I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, there is a cheat sheet that you can bring to the final exam. Again, as always, it's up to you to prepare your own cheat sheet. But you can have a full sheet front and back because there's a lot more material that's going to appear on the final. So you're going to need to write some more stuff down. Okay. Uh, last thing to say is optional final exam review session next week during our normal lab time. Uh, but again, you don't have to attend that. Um, the review packet is already available on Canvas for the final exam. Has anyone taken a look at that yet? So if you haven't, start going through it to study for the final. I'm going to post the solutions uh, late next week to Canvas. Okay? All right. So any questions about anything I just said? Anything at all? All right, then. So in that case, um, let's move into this new lecture on Maxwell's equations. This stuff is coming from chapter 16 of volume 2 of the textbook. Uh, it's the very last chapter in volume 2. Okay? And I'm actually kind of excited to teach this because I've never had the opportunity to teach Maxwell's equations before. Um, I have taught 46 before, but we never got around to this. So I'm glad that we have time to fit this in at the end. So first, I want to give you a little bit of history. Maxwell's equations are named after this guy, James Clerk Maxwell, who lived in the mid-1800s. Uh, he was a Scottish physicist and a mathematician. He studied a lot of different things, actually. Um, one of his main achievements, of course, was in electricity and magnetism, as we're going to learn about in this lecture. But he also studied thermodynamics, made a lot of important contributions to that field. Uh, he even studied some pretty out there things that you wouldn't associate with physics, like how human beings perceive color, right? Color perception is something he studies. Um, let's talk a little bit about what some of the major achievements of Maxwell were. Um, he's greatly responsible for what we call the second great unification in physics, okay? So does anyone know what the first great unification in physics is? It's I'll give you a hint. It's uh, Newton who's responsible for that. The first great unification in physics is Newton showing that gravity works the same way here on Earth, so the way objects fall to the ground when you drop them, 
as it does out there in space. You know, planets pulling on each other and orbiting each other. That's the same phenomenon fundamentally, and he unified those two ideas, okay? The second great unification in physics came from Maxwell, and he basically showed that electricity and magnetism are just two sides of the same coin. It's really the same underlying phenomena that explains E fields and B fields and the way they behave, okay? Um, related to this, he discovered the nature of light, okay? And we're going to talk a lot about this in the upcoming days. Maxwell showed that light, the light that you see right now, is nothing more than a wave consisting of E fields and B fields, which are oscillating at some frequency, okay? That's a preview of what's to come. We're going to show that in some detail. Um, but he's responsible for really discovering the wave nature of light in a, in a really concrete way. And he also did some important work on what's called the kinetic theory of gases. So basically showing that you could explain the way a gas behaves in terms of its pressure, temperature, and volume, etc., in terms of little atoms that are just flying around within a gas. Um, so yeah, he did a lot, and most people would say, you know, if you were to rank the greatest physicists of all time, Newton and Einstein would probably be in the one and two spots. You can make a good case that Maxwell would be in the number three spot. Okay, so pretty important work. Okay, so that's the history lesson. Now let's move on to some physics. We're gonna be looking at a capacitor over the next, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And I'm going to show you something about the way a capacitor behaves, specifically when it's being charged or discharged, that you might not have thought about before, okay? So we're familiar with the capacitor consists of two plates, which are oppositely charged, plus Q minus Q, right? So let's say that the capacitor is not just sitting there with some fixed amount of charge on it. Let's say it's in the process of being charged. So more charge is being added to it over time. So if that's the case, um, then the charge on the capacitor plates is growing, right? This plus Q is getting bigger, and the absolute value of this minus Q is also getting bigger. But in order for the charge to be changing, there needs to be some current, right? That charge has to be coming from somewhere. Where is it coming from? It's coming from the electrical current that is going into those plates, all right? So we have a current I, which is basically feeding this plate and allowing the charge on it to increase. And there's current going away from this plate, which allows the charge on it to get more and more negative, basically. Okay, so that's what's going on while you are charging a capacitor in terms of the wires that directly hook up to it. So that picture makes sense. We've seen this before. Okay. Okay, so what do we know about electrical currents? Electrical currents produce what type of field, E or B? B fields, right? Electrical currents, like the ones we see in the wires leading to the capacitor, those create magnetic fields. And if you have a straight wire like this, the magnetic field, what does it look like, generally speaking? What kind of like geometry does the field have? It, yeah, it sort of loops around the wire. Remember that? So if I have a current here, I'm going to have a B field line looping around this wire. And then if I have a current up there, I'm going to have a B field line looping around that wire. So the general picture looks something like this. Would we agree? I'm charging a capacitor. So I have sort of a B field looping around like this and like this uh, around the wires that are connected to the capacitor. Okay? All right. That's not all, right? Because we have currents. Those produce the B fields that I'm showing you here. We also have an electric field between the two plates, right? If I have a plus Q on this plate and a minus Q on this plate, I'm going to have an electric field in between the two plates. Which way, can you guys tell me, does this electric field between the two plates point? It's going to point down, right? It's got to point away from the positive charge towards the negative charge. We know that's how it works. So let's indicate that E field right here on the slide like this, okay? So I just want to establish, we already know everything to establish this picture, but I want to establish that we have a B field and an E field 
present when it comes to this charging capacitor, and that's what they look like, okay? So here's what we're going to do with this picture. We're going to apply Ampere's law in two different cases, okay? Remember, when you apply Ampere's law, which says integral over some kind of closed loop equals b dot dl, uh, or sorry, is integral b dot dl, um, and that equals mu naught times i enclosed, we have to choose some kind of surface to apply Ampere's law to. So I'm going to show you two different surfaces that we'll use, and um, just follow along with me. It's going to lead to something kind of surprising. Okay. So this is the first surface I want you to consider. It's very simple. It's just a circular surface where we have the current I on this wire kind of piercing right through that circular surface. Got it? Okay, my second surface is going to be a little different. I'm going to make my second surface in such a way that I'm specifically avoiding enclosing that current. Okay? How can I do that? Basically by making my surface dip down here between the plates to avoid the current. Okay, let me show you what that looks like. So there's my second surface, okay? So it's bounded by this same loop up here, but it goes down here in between the two plates. Okay, so that's the picture. And just to be clear, the Amperian loop that we use when we apply Ampere's law is this circle right here. But again, for the first surface, I have the current going right through it. And for the second surface, there's no current going through it actually. Okay, so can you see that? Okay, that presents kind of a problem in a way. Because the integral of b dot dl has to be the same for these two surfaces. When we integrate b dot dl for surface one or surface two, here's what we're doing. We're going around this loop right here, which defines each surface, and we're integrating the b field around that loop. Okay? And you can probably figure out how that works. It's just b times 2 pi r. But that's not really what's important. The, the important thing is because we have this same exact loop bounding surface 1 and surface 2, that the integral b dot dl is going to be the same for those two surfaces. Okay? So, you convinced? Yeah? Okay. But here's the problem. Here's where the problem comes in. We, we established b dot dl is the same for the two surfaces. However, the enclosed current, which is the other side of Ampere's law, is not the same for both surfaces, okay? For surface one, we have whatever current is in this wire piercing right through it. So that's how much current we're enclosing is I. For surface two, again, we've specifically avoided, we've constructed our surface so that the current does not pierce through it. So we're not enclosing anything, okay? So is that kind of a problem? Because b dot dl is supposed to just equal mu naught times i enclosed, and that's just supposed to generally hold true. But I've shown you an example where clearly Ampere's law is not holding true, because b dot dl for surface 1 gives you the expected result but b dot dl for surface 2 doesn't give you the expected result, okay? So, that is a big problem that Maxwell realized was present in uh, Ampere's law, okay? Maxwell uh, basically realized that this is a situation where Ampere's law, as we know it, kind of breaks down, okay? So what Maxwell did is he corrected the equation. Okay, he realized there's actually an extra term in the equation that no one before had realized must be there in order for it to work in all cases, including this weird case that I'm showing you here. Okay? That correction to Ampere's law is known as the displacement current. Okay, so I've been, I'm just going to admit, I've been lying to you the whole time. Ampere's law is not just b dot dl equals u naught times i enclosed. It's that plus this additional term called the displacement current, okay? I'm going to show you how it's written. It's just written as plus mu naught times ID. 
And I'm going to explain to you now what this extra term means and how to calculate it. Okay? So any questions up to this point? Yeah? Uh, the blue circuit, is it like the tone that bends them? The blue, yeah, think of it like a bowl. That's kind of dipping down beneath the two plates. Um, that's open at the top. Think of it that way. Yeah. Anything else? And you can draw that shape different ways as long as, again, you kind of avoid enclosing the current. And you do that by going in between the plates. Okay? And of course, there's no current in between the plates, right? It's just when you feel it. And actually, that kind of hints at what this displacement current thing is all about. So the displacement current in Ampere's law with the correction that Maxwell introduced is like an additional current term. It's another mu naught times I term on the right-hand side. But this displacement current, which is what we just call it, that's, that's just a colloquial name for it, um, is not caused by moving charges, okay? If we're saying there's some kind of so-called displacement current in between the two plates, well, it's not the same as the current that's in the wires. When we say there's current in the wires, we're saying there are charges that are moving through the wire, okay? When we say there's a displacement current in between the plates, there's no moving charge there, right? It's just empty space with an E field in between the plates, okay? So what's actually going on when we say displacement current, what we actually mean is there's an E field there and the E field in there is changing over time, okay? Now think about this, right? The more charge we have on the plates, the stronger the E field. Would you agree? So if we're in the process of charging this capacitor, the amount of charge on the plates is growing, then the strength of the E field is growing, okay? So that means we have a time-dependent or a time-varying E field in between the plates. That's what a displacement current really is. It's when you have a time-varying E field in some region, like you see here, in between the plates, okay? So let me show you what the actual equation for displacement current is. It's basically this. The, the real precise definition is the displacement current through some type of surface is given by the time derivative of the electric flux through that surface. All right, so remember the definition of electric flux? It's kind of like magnetic flux, what we've been working with for a while. Electric flux is just how many E-field lines are going through a surface at a given time, right? So we denote this with psi E. Okay, so this equation says the displacement current is the derivative of my electric flux with respect to time. That's d psi, uh, d phi, sorry, dt, like this. And uh, we multiply that by epsilon naught for this to actually work out. Okay. So another way to say that is we have epsilon naught as a constant in the front, and then we have the derivative with respect to time of E dot dA integrated over our surface. That's how we think about electric flux, okay? So the electric flux through some surface is changing, then we say we have a displacement current through that surface, okay? Now, how should we think about this displacement current? Well, oops, sorry about that. The displacement current has a direction to it, just like conventional current does, right? You know, in circuit diagrams, how we show a current maybe going clockwise or counterclockwise. It's the same deal for displacement current. There's a simple rule you can follow to just get the direction of the displacement current right in any given situation. Displacement current is in the same direction as the E field if E is increasing over time. Okay? So if you have a surface with an E field going through it, and the strength of that E field is increasing over time, then the displacement current is just going exactly with the E field, okay? If the E field is decreasing over time, then the displacement current is just in the opposite direction as the E field. So it's a pretty simple rule to remember just which way the displacement current is going. Now, real current, actual moving charges, what do they do? They create a B field, right? We, we showed that already. I have current going through this wire, there's a B field looping around it. 
Displacement current works the same way. Just like with real current, we can think of it as the source of a magnetic field. It's a, something that creates a B field. Okay, so in other words, if I have a changing electric field in between these two plates, okay, let's say the E field strength is growing because I'm charging the capacitor and adding more charge to it. Then I have a displacement current going in the exact same direction as that E field in between the plates. And what does that displacement current do? It creates a B field, which loops around it just like as if there were a real current there, okay? So again, it's not actually moving charge, of course, but the way it functions in our equations is that it's a source of the magnetic field, just like real current, just like real moving charge, okay? So it's a little tricky, but that is the correction that Maxwell made to Ampere's law, okay? So we're gonna spend you know, the next probably you know, hour or so just going over how to use this modified version of Ampere's law with this new term called the displacement current in it. Okay, so before we do that, any questions so far? All right, so we'll keep moving. Oh yeah, go ahead. Has there ever been called anything else as a non axis current or? Um, that's the name it, it was given. Yeah, you could argue whether that's a good name for it or not. Um, it's kind of, in a sense, it's a misleading term, right? But um, this is what it was called, especially when people were thinking about this issue right here, okay? Um, all right, so here is our updated version of Ampere's law. Now it's actually called the Ampere-Maxwell law, because basically Ampere's law, as we've seen it before, is incomplete, and to get a fully correct version of the law, you need this additional term, which was discovered by Maxwell. Okay, so that's why it's called the Ampere-Maxwell law. To get the full equation correct, both of these people had to uh, kind of do some work. Okay, so let's go through it. What do we have? We have integral b dot dl over some loop. And that's a closed loop. That equals mu naught times I enclosed. We're familiar with that part. Here's the additional term which we call the displacement current, right? So you can think of this as mu naught times a displacement current, where the displacement current is this part, epsilon naught times d phi dt. And this is the electric flux that's changing right here. So let's take a big picture look at that equation and what it's telling us. Because um, if we think back, what does Ampere's law actually do? It relates B fields, Okay, that's what you see on the left side of the equation is something involving a B field. It relates B fields to the sources. You can think of it like this. The left side of the equation is telling you something about a B field that exists out there in space. And the right side of the equation is telling you what's causing that B field, right? So we already knew that B fields can be produced by electric currents, which are just moving charges, okay? But the new thing that we just learned is that B fields can also be caused or created by electric fields that are changing in time. So even if you have no actual moving charge, if you just have an electric field that's changing over time in some region of space, that is producing a B field. That's what this equation is telling us. So there's two different ways to produce a B field. All right? And if we compare that to something else, um, in particular, E fields, how are they produced? It kind of makes sense, right? Because according to Gauss's law, right, we can create an E field just by having some electric charge, some Q sitting around, okay? But what did we learn about in the last chapter on Faraday's law? You can produce an E field, you can create an E field just by having not electric charge sitting around, but a magnetic field that's changing over time. That's what Faraday's law basically says, right? So if you have a magnetic field that's changing over time, it creates an E field, and that E field might cause current to start flowing. That's usually the situation we look at in our examples. But the big picture idea is that if you have a changing magnetic field, that can create an E field. So you see there's kind of a nice symmetry here. One field changing, 
produces the other type of field. That's what you can see from this, okay? All right, so let's do an example. All right, this might seem kind of abstract until you see a few examples. So here's the first one we're gonna do. Still looking at this parallel plate capacitor idea. Here's what's going on. We have a parallel plate capacitor with a capacitance C, uh, whose plates have an area A, so it's the area of each plate, and the distance between them is D, okay? We go ahead and connect this to a resistor, which has resistance R, and a battery, which has a voltage V. We have a switch here, so we can kind of set current in motion by closing the switch, or open the switch and cut off the current. So let's say that we close that switch, and current begins to flow at T equals zero. So we're gonna do two things here, okay? We're gonna find the actual current in these wires as a function of time. So that would be I as a function of time just flowing through these wires. And then also, we're gonna find the displacement current in between the plates of this capacitor as a function of time. Okay, so the real current, remember we call that I. Remember the definition of real current? That's dq dt. That's the charge per unit time moving through the wires. The displacement current, this is this new concept, we call that ID. What's that equal to? It's epsilon naught times the derivative of our electric flux with respect to time. All right, so we, we now have what we need to calculate that, okay? So for the real current, maybe someone can help me out. Do you guys remember what type of circuit we have here? It's an RC circuit, right? We have a resistor and a capacitor connected to a battery. We actually derived in class what the current as a function of time through the wires of an RC circuit is, okay? We've already done that derivation, so why don't we just write down what that is, okay? The real work we need to do is to find the displacement current, okay? Okay, so starting with the wires, right? Current in the wires. Just remember that what we have here is what's known as a charging RC circuit, right? We're not discharging, we're charging the circuit. And so I hope you remember that the current as a function of time in this type of circuit is equal to V divided by R. That's like our maximum current times what? You guys remember? There's like an exponential thing going on, right? E to the minus T over RC, okay? So we derived this in uh, chapter 10, by the way. So I'll just leave that on the page, okay? We already know that. Okay, what about the displacement current between the plates? So let's get a good picture of what's going on here. We have two capacitor plates, one up here, and another one down here. And they're oppositely charged, so let's say plus Q, minus Q, okay? I know I have an E-field in between the plates. I'll just draw one of those E-field lines going down like this, all right? So, first of all, let's write down a formula for the electric flux, okay? The electric flux is the integral of E dot dA over some type of surface. So we better draw a surface to you know, have a flux going through that surface. The way you should do this is just to draw a little circular surface right here that the E-field is kind of piercing through. You see that? Then we can talk about the flux going through this particular surface, all right? Now, um, what we typically do when it comes to the E-field in between the plates of the capacitor is we assume that it's uniform. We know in reality it kind of leaks out the edges, right? And sort of bends at the edges. 
but let's just assume to a good approximation that it's uniform. If that's the case, then I don't actually need to do this integral. I can just say it's e dot a, okay, rather than some sort of integral over the surface. And again, what we're doing here is assuming a uniform field. Okay. And how should I evaluate this dot product? I should evaluate it as the strength of the E field times the area, okay? And then um, cosine of some angle. Well, I've oriented this so that the area vector, remember that's perpendicular to the surface, would be pointing straight down along with the E field, okay? So that means the angle between them is just zero. In other words, the flux through this surface of E field lines is just the strength of the E field in between the plates, which we are assuming is uniform, times the area, which is gonna be the area of the plates, okay? So, um, A, I'm just gonna leave that alone. Does anyone remember, we derived this a long, long time ago. There's a formula for the E field in between the plates of oppositely charged uh, capacitor plates like this. It's sigma divided by epsilon. Okay, I don't know if that looks familiar, but we've derived this previously, so we're gonna use it. That means the electric flux can be written as sigma divided by epsilon naught times A, because cos uh, cosine zero is just gonna give us one, right? Okay, does anyone remember what sigma means? That, yeah, that's the charge per unit area on the plates. That's called the surface charge density on the plates. So I'm going to replace that with Q divided by A. Does that make sense? So sigma, which I'm now writing as Q divided by A, divided by epsilon naught times A. That's the electric flux. But the A obviously just cancels out, doesn't it? Right? So what do I have? I just have Q, which is the magnitude of the charge on plates, divided by epsilon naught. All right, what's my displacement current? We're going to just go to the definition. The displacement current between the plates, by definition, is epsilon naught times the derivative of the electric flux, which we have right here, with respect to time. So what do I have? I have epsilon naught times the derivative with respect to time of this thing, which is Q divided by epsilon naught. So guess what? Epsilon naught cancels, right? What am I left with? DQ DT. What's that equal to? That's just the current in the wires, right? So what we've just shown is that this displacement current has the exact same value as the current in the wires, okay? So what that means is, it's just V divided by R times E to the minus T over RC. So the current in the wires and the displacement current between the plates is exactly the same, okay? So we have any questions on that? You should just know how to do this calculation for the time being, okay? All right, anything at all? So this is an example, again, of how to calculate displacement current. We'll see some more of these, but that's the first one we've seen. So here's the next thing we're going to do with this, all right? We are going to do sort of a follow-up question where... Um, oops, I think I went too far, right? Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, so we're going to do sort of a follow-up question. It's the same exact RC circuit from before. And um, instead of asking about the displacement current in between the plates, we're now asking about the B field in between the plates. Okay? Um, so what we're going to do is find the magnetic field between the capacitor plates as a function of both distance from the center which we'll call R, and time. So for that, we're going to use the Ampere-Maxwell law. Okay? 
Now there's one little uh, piece to this, which I just have to tell you, okay? That I'm not gonna be able to prove rigorously here. We know that B field lines around actual currents form loops, right? Same for this so-called displacement current. The B field around it is gonna be forming a nice little loop, circular loop like this around the displacement current. Okay, so that's all we need to know to apply the Ampere-Maxwell law to find the B field produced by this so-called displacement current, okay? So here's how it's gonna go. The Ampere-Maxwell law says integral B dot DL over, by the way, this loop that I drew previously, that's what we're gonna use for this, that equals mu naught times I enclosed plus mu naught times ID, which is this new displacement current term. Okay. So if we're considering just in between the plates, do I have any actual current? No. So that means this first term right here, which says I enclosed, I can set to zero. It's no real current. Okay. But I do have a displacement current and I just found it over there. Okay. So that's what I'm going to be dealing with here. All right, so I already know what ID is going to be. I'm going to use the previous result. What is B dot DL integrated over this loop going to look like? B2 pi R. Yeah, Let, let's think about it, right? I know my B field loops around just like this little dashed line is looping around uh, the center of the plates. And so for my DL, I could just think of that as like a little bit of displacement along that loop, right? So B dot DL is a dot product. That would be the strength of the B field times DL and then cosine of the angle between them. But the thing is, both the B field and DL point in the same direction. They both point tangent to this little circle I drew, right? So I would say cosine zero for the angle between them, okay? Then the next thing I would do is pull out B as a constant, and then I'm just integrating over DL. So this is something you should be familiar with from before, right? And then integrating over DL is just the total distance around the loop, which is the circumference. And that's where the 2 pi r comes in, where r is just the radius of that loop that I just drew, okay? So this is just the strength of the B field times 2 pi r. So let's put it all together in the Ampere-Maxwell law. The left side looks like B times 2 pi r, as we just said. The right side looks like mu naught times the displacement current ID. That's this thing which we found earlier. That's V divided by big R, resistance times e to the minus t over rc. Okay, so to solve for b, that's all we need to do now. Uh, just divide out the 2 pi r, right? That's all we need to get the answer. So all of the factors in front are mu naught on top, v on top, 2 pi little r, which is like our radius, and then big R, which is our resistance times e to the minus t over rc, okay? So that's a formula for the B field strength in between the two plates, okay? So the lesson here is we know how to calculate displacement current. Basically, if you have a changing electric flux, you have a displacement current, and then you can plug that into the Ampere-Maxwell law, and it behaves just like a real current in the sense that it creates a B field, okay? That's what we do. Go ahead. At the beginning of the part, you said that you weren't going to prove something. You weren't going to um, the B field. Just how the B field lines form loops around the current. Yeah. So that's just something we can take for granted just to do this. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So um, 
This is a follow-up that is going to depend on some work that we already did. My question for you guys is, same RC circuit as before. Okay, we know how this works. But the question now is, let's find the strength of the B-field in this region. So we're not in between the plates anymore. We're actually surround, we're kind of looping around the wire as opposed to being in between the two plates. So in that case, um, come up with a formula, much like we just did, for the strength of this B field. It's going to depend on time, of course, and distance R. All right? So you're going to use the Ampere Maxwell law to work this out. So I just showed you how the B dot BL part works, and you've seen that many times before. What you have to do is decide, okay, is there a real current or a displacement current here, and what is it? So take a few minutes to work that out, and then uh, we'll discuss it here. And while you're doing that, um, I'm going to hand back some tests. So who came in late didn't get their test back? All right, for shame. Uh, Think about this. Anyone have an answer? Is it the same thing? Same exact thing as before. Yeah. Why is that? Because we already showed that the current going through these wires and the displacement current in between the plates are identical, right? So if you work it out, they're going to produce the same exact type of B field. Okay? But let's just go through the exercise. Um, so let me show you what we worked out before, right? The actual current going through the wires is given by this. It's our RC circuit charging equation for current. Okay? And we don't have any displacement current in this case because we're not talking about the empty space in between the plates. We're talking about real current. So the picture you should have is this. We have a real current like this going towards one of the capacitor plates. We have this loop which we draw around it. And we say the full Ampere-Maxwell law, which applies to this, is B dot DL integrated over the loop equals mu naught times I enclosed. That represents the real current plus mu naught times ID, which is our displacement current. Okay, in this case, because our loop surrounds the actual wire, we don't have any displacement current, but we do have some real current. But these are the same. So the B dot DL part, as we already showed, is B times 2 pi r. 
And the actual current, again, let me show you what we wrote down before, is this, which is V over R times E to the minus T over RC. Okay, so solve for B. You can probably tell we're going to get the same thing. Let's write it down, divide out this 2 pi R part. We have mu naught times V divided by 2 pi R, where R, little r, is the radius which gives us the distance away from the wire, and big R is the resistance. Okay, and then we have e to the minus t over rc like this. Okay? So that is the uh, three-part saga on that problem. We're going to do some different problems, um, but before we move on from this, any questions? Will there ever be a case where the not in this case. If you're talking about a wire that is directly charging a capacitor, this is always going to be the case. But not every case of using the Ampere-Maxwell law involves charging a capacitor, so we're going to see some different examples now. Okay? All right. We're going to start with some kind of conceptual stuff, just getting the directions of displacement current and V field right. Okay? So let me show you what you're looking at here. What you are looking at in this picture is a uniform electric field. This is an E field. Which way is it going? It's pointing out towards you. We have a surface, which we're going to use for reference right here. It's a circular surface. And you can see there's obviously some electric flux through that surface, right? There's lines going through it. My question for you is, let's suppose that the E field strength is increasing over time. So the E field still points this way, but it just gets stronger over time. So the first question is this. What is the direction of the displacement current going through this surface? Okay? I showed you how that is supposed to work in a previous slide, so go back to like 15 minutes ago. And then what is the direction of the B field? So for the displacement current, just tell me into the page, out of the pitch. For the B field, you kind of have a sense it's going to loop around this surface. So tell me if it loops around clockwise or counterclockwise. So take a few minutes to think about this, and then we'll put it to a vote. Okay? You guys remember if the flux is increasing, that means displacement current goes the same way as the E field. If flux is decreasing, displacement current goes the opposite way. So that's what you need to remember here. And then once you know which way the displacement current is going, you can uh, find the B field, right? Just using the right hand rule. Okay, so see if you can get that. Alright. Gotta see some right hand rules out there. to vote? You have to vote. Okay. First question. What is the direction of the displacement current in this case? Is it going into the page or out of the page? Who says A, into the page? B, out of the page. Good. Okay. What about the direction of the B field? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Uh, who says clockwise? Counterclockwise. Okay. You get it, right? Just to recap. What do we have? We have an increasing E field strength. That means the flux going through this surface of electric field lines is increasing. The way the displacement current works is if the flux is increasing, it goes in the same direction as the E field. That means our displacement current is coming out of the page, just like you said. How do we figure out which way the B field goes? Given the current, that's the right hand rule. 
you can take your thumb, point that in the direction of the current. Okay, that's out of the page. And then your right hand's fingers are going to curl in the direction of the B field. So that's counterclockwise, right? Got it? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Yeah? Would it be appropriate to use a uh, throwing hand rule to have the E field with your fingers curl in that direction, kind of like you would with the B field and current? Um, so, sorry, say again? So, like, how, you know, remember uh, we were chatting last time about current, right? Uh, if you have current coming out of the page, for example, or B field coming out of the page, the current would run a certain direction based yeah. on where the thumb is. Clockwise is kind of clockwise. So, would, we, would that be the same principle applied here? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's, that's another way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. All right, here's another one for you guys. Now we have an E field, it's uniform, but the strength of it is changing over time once again. Let's say the strength of the E field is decreasing over time. And let's also flip its direction. So we have an E field going into the page like this, but it's getting weaker over time. Okay, so same two questions pertaining to this. Think about it for about 30 seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll vote on it. Have your answers. Got a pretty good idea what the answer is. Okay. Displacement curve through this circular surface into the page or out of the page? Who says A into the page? Who says B out of the page? Okay, good. Direction of the current. Who says A clockwise? B counterclockwise. You got it. All right. Again, in this case, we have an E field, which is creating a flux of electric field lines through this surface. But that flux is decreasing because the strength of this field is decreasing. All right? So for that reason, the displacement current goes in the opposite direction as the E field. Okay, that's the case for a decreasing E field. That's the rule. So since our E field is going into the page, the displacement current is coming out of the page. All right? And then just like before, the right-hand rule tells us the direction of the B field it creates, which is going to be counterclockwise. So it's the same answers as before. Okay, So displacement current coming out like this, B field looping around like this, counterclockwise. Okay, So that's just how you get the direction straight with the um, Ampere-Maxwell law. So any questions on these two examples? Hopefully pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's do another example. Actually quite similar to what we just did, except now we're going to calculate something, okay? So, here's the situation. We have a uniform E field, which is pointing out towards us out of the page. Suppose that the strength of this E field is increasing over time, but at specifically this rate, 275 newtons per coulomb per second. So that is, in other words, dE dt. That's the rate of change of the E field strength. It's given by this derivative here. So two questions. What is the displacement current through this surface? And now let's be a little more specific. Let's say it has a radius of 12 centimeters. And let's also say we want to calculate the B field strength. Okay, to put an actual number to that rather than just saying it's going uh, counterclockwise. Okay. So, let's do that. Um, I'm going to kind of copy down what we already have. Remember, we have the circular surface, which looks something like this. And going through that surface, we have some E field lines. Uh, those are coming out of the page from our perspective. Okay, I'm just going to show one of them, but we have E field uniformly coming out of the page. All right, this surface also has a radius. I'm going to call that little r, just like that. Let's start with this. Let's start by finding the electric flux through this surface. That's what we call um, 
phi sub e. That's our electric flux. Okay, the definition of this is the integral over the surface of e dot dA. That's how we define it. But I can do a simpler calculation than this integral, right? Because I have a uniform field, I can just do this as E, whatever that uniform strength is, which applies all over the surface, dot A, which is just like a total area of the surface, all right? So, like any other dot product, we can think of this as the magnitude E times the magnitude of A times the cosine of the angle between them. So, this area, the surface we're talking about, lies on the page. The area vector is always perpendicular to the surface, remember? So we can think about that A vector is also coming out of the page at us, like this, which means there's really zero degrees between the two, okay? Okay, I'm dealing with a circular surface, right? So what should I put for the area? What's the formula for the area? R squared. Just pi r squared, right? So this is E, however strong the E field is, times pi r squared, where that is the area of this circle. Okay, so displacement current, that's what we'll do next. Basically depends on this. Remember, the definition of displacement current, I sub D, is equal to epsilon naught times the derivative with respect to time of the electric flux. That's the definition of displacement current, which we've seen before. So in other words, we're doing epsilon naught times the derivative with respect to time of this whole thing. In other words, E times pi r squared. So out of these different variables in the brackets, which are constant? Pi r squared, right? Pull that out. The E is not constant though, right? So we have epsilon naught times pi r squared times dE dt. That would give us the displacement current going through this surface, which would be coming out at us, by the way. Okay? So we can now put a number to that. We have various constants here. You guys remember what epsilon naught is equal to? Is it 8.85? Yeah, epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to what power again? Negative 12. Does anyone remember the units on this? Years per second. Coulomb? It's, it's actually, yes, that flips. Coulomb squared divided by newtons times meters squared. I know it's a weird unit, but that's what it is. Uh, then what do we have? We have pi times r squared. Remember, we're just given some numbers here. 12 and a half centimeters is r. So in meters, that would be 0.125 meters. And we're going to square that whole thing. And then we have dE dt. We were directly given that. That's the rate of change, or how quickly the E-field is changing. That was 275 newtons per coulomb per second, like this. That's how I want to write it. OK? Um, OK, that looks pretty good. Let's actually think about the units for a second. I have um, newtons here on the bottom, canceling newtons here. I have meters squared canceling meters squared. And then I have Coulomb squared on top, and then a factor of Coulombs on the bottom, and a factor of seconds on the bottom. So overall, I have Coulombs over seconds, Coulombs per second. Uh, what is that unit? That should be familiar. What's a Coulomb per second equivalent to? That's an amp, right? So that's another reason why we call this thing a displacement current. It has units of amps, just like real current does, okay? Can someone compute what that is? Um, that's off just a little bit. How about 1.19 times 
Yep. 1.19, and I'll just put two other digits. 1.1947, we'll keep three at the end. Times 10 to the minus 10. That is a tiny amount of current, okay? That's just minuscule. Um, and that's rounded off, 1.19, 10 to the minus 10 amps. So that would be our displacement current with an actual numerical value attached, okay? All right, last part of this is to get the magnetic field. Okay. And how should we think about this magnetic field, by the way? We have an E field, which is increasing over time, right? So that means we have a flux going through this surface that's increasing over time, because the E field is getting stronger, more and more lines are going to be going through that surface as time goes on. In that situation, we say the displacement current is in the same direction as E. So it's just like we have a current coming out of the page. What kind of B field would that tend to create? Well, point your thumb out of the page like this, curl your fingers in the direction which B would be going. Okay? That would be uh, counterclockwise. So we can imagine now that there is a B field looping around like this. Because of the fact that there's a changing E field, we get this looping B field as a result. Okay? And we can find out what that B field is in terms of its strength. For that, we're going to use the Ampere-Maxwell law, which says integral of B dot BL over this loop equals mu naught times I enclosed where we understand that to represent real current plus u naught times ID, which is our displacement current. Okay? Now in this case, we don't have any real current. We have a displacement current, which is really a result of this changing E field. Okay? Um, so to solve for this, we have B times 2 pi R. I worked that out for you before. You know how this works, right? If we integrate around a complete loop of a, a B field line. For this integral B dot DL, we get B times two pi R. And that equals mu naught times ID, which means we can directly solve for B now. B is equal to mu naught times ID, okay, divided by two pi R. All right, so let's put in the numbers. What we have is mu naught. Does anyone remember the value of mu naught? Four pi ten to the minus seven. Four pi ten to the minus seven uh, tesla meter tesla times meters per amp. So it's a TMA, right? Um, what's ID? That's what we found over here. That's one point one nine four seven with uh, three six digits. Sorry. 10 to the minus 10 amps. And then we divide that by 2 pi r's. And then r is just, again, this radius, which is 12 and a half centimeters per 0.125 meters, just like this. Now, it's a very small amount of current, so we expect a pretty small B field, right? Can someone tell me what it works out to? 1.91 times 10 to the negative 16? 1.91, <laughs> 10 to the minus 16 Tesla. So that's, that's very small. That's like billions of times weaker than Earth's magnetic field. So yeah, um, when we introduce this correction, basically, to Ampere's law, it generally results in pretty weak B fields for the most part. But it's still really important to understand eventually how light actually works. We're going to get to that. Okay, so any questions about how we did this? Hopefully the math isn't too bad. It's in a lot of ways similar to how Faraday's law works. Okay, um, all right, so if we don't have any questions on that, we're going to keep moving. Remember, this is called Maxwell's equations, so there's more than one. Okay, one of them which we just went over is called the Ampere-Maxwell Law. 
You've kind of seen it before, but there's this correction term to it, okay? So now you know the full equation with the correction term. There's another equation that you've never seen before, and I'm going to explain it now. Fortunately, it's a lot simpler, okay? This is called Gauss's Law, but for B fields, all right? You've already seen Gauss's Law before for electric fields. You guys remember how that works? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, electric fields, uh, we have E dot dA equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. That's, that's what that was. Gauss's law for magnetic fields says this. B dot dA integrated over some closed surface is equal to zero. Okay? The right-hand side is just straight up zero. So what is this saying? B dot dA, that is magnetic flux, right? It's the flux of B field lines through some surface. But when I show the integral like this with a little circle on it, that means it's a closed surface. So we're talking about something like, I don't know, a sphere, which is fully enclosing something. Or a cylinder, let's say, which is fully enclosing something. As opposed to like an open surface like this, okay? Which is not enclosing anything. So as long as we have a closed surface, the flux through that surface of B field lines is always zero. Here's what that means, okay? It means that the way B fields work is they form closed loops. B field lines always just loop around. So if you follow a B field line and you follow it for long enough, you're always guaranteed to just come right back around to where you start. Unlike electric field lines, which sometimes just go all the way off to infinity, Remember how we have like a charge Q that you feel lines just point straight away from it? They don't loop around. They just go off to infinity. B field lines always, always loop around in every single circumstance. Okay, so that implies that every magnet, everything that creates a magnetic field, fundamentally is what we call a dipole. It has a north and a south pole. The lines come out of the North Pole and loop back around into the South Pole. And you cannot separate them as just an isolated North Pole and an isolated South Pole. So that's what we would call a monopole. If you just had an isolated North Pole or an isolated South Pole, those don't exist. Every magnet looks like this, as a North and a South Pole. And as a result, it has these looping B field lines. Did you have a question? So, um, I want to give you kind of a sense of this, right? I'm going to show you a closed surface in the presence of this bar magnet, okay? And that closed surface, let's just imagine, is like spherical. So, if I put that surface right here, can you see that we have an equal number of field lines coming in to that surface, which are coming in through this side, as we have exiting the surface? Right? That should be pretty clear to see. Equal number of lines coming in as going out. The lines going into the surface, we consider negative flux. Lines coming out, we consider that positive flux, if you recall. So overall, we have zero total flux. If lines are just coming in and then going right back out, right? And notice if I move my surface somewhere else, like, you know, you know put it right around the north pole of the magnet, let's say, it's still the same deal, right? I have a bunch of lines coming in this way, but then immediately exiting this way. So the total flux is still zero. No matter where you put that surface, doesn't matter where, you move it up here, same deal, same amount of lines coming in as going out. You can move it anywhere you like, you can move it down here, same amount of lines coming in as going out. This is how every single magnetic field works, okay? That's what this equation is saying. So, do you have any questions on that? Go ahead. Um, about the magnetic dipole, so that, like, if you were to cut that magnet in half, or, you know, a laser cut or whatever, yeah. <laughs> it would just form two new, like, electrons yep. rings, so you'd not have two new magnets with two new poles, like, four poles. Or yep, exactly. Magnets. Take a bar magnet, snap it in half. Guess what? You don't have a north and a south pole. What you have is two smaller bar magnets. Each one of them has north and south. Break it in half again, you still have each piece with a north and a south pole. 
you can never break it down to just get like an isolated north or south pole. This is really the smallest unit of a magnet, it's a dipole, okay? All right, so what, again, what we're saying is a magnetic monopole, where it's just an isolated north or just an isolated south pole, does not exist. That's what Gauss's law for magnetic fields is telling us. So let's just think about, okay, hypothetically, if we did have magnetic monopoles, what would that look like? So again, definition here, a magnetic monopole would be just an isolated north or an isolated south pole of a magnet in complete isolation, not a dipole. And again, I want to stress, these things don't exist. They've never been observed before, and there's a pretty good reason to think that they don't exist, and they're never going to be observed, all right? But if they did exist, this is what they would look like. Let's say we had a north monopole, right? That would just have field lines that go away from that pole and just go off to infinity without, again, looping back around, okay? If we had an isolated south pole, that would just involve lines coming into that, uh, again, not forming closed loops, okay? So I want to show you um, what it looks like if we think about the flux of field lines around these objects right here, okay? If these kinds of objects did exist, right, then Gauss's law for magnetism, which I just showed you, B dot DA around a closed surface, that would not actually be true if these things existed. Because let me draw a closed surface, let's say, around this north monopole, okay? Just like a spherical surface around this north monopole. This clearly does have some overall flux through it, right? Overall, we have lines coming out, okay? And we don't have them looping back around and going in. So there is a net flux there. And the same goes for the south pole. We have a net flux of lines going in. So if these types of things existed, then B dot DA integrated over this surface or that surface, it wouldn't be zero, okay? So basically, what the equation I just showed you is telling us is monopoles like this don't exist. That's how you can guarantee that integral goes to zero. Okay, now, the idea that this type of object doesn't exist, it seems to hold up, right? We've never observed one before, um, and the equations of uh, Maxwell's equations make a lot more sense if this is true. However, you always have to be open to revising the equations, right? Maybe some new evidence will come along that says these monopoles do exist. If that's the case, we're actually going to have to revise uh, the equation for Gauss's law for magnetism. There are some theories out there, some really weird out there exotic theories that do say maybe monopoles should exist, like string theory, for example. But again, conventional thinking is these things don't exist. We've never seen them before. They probably don't exist. Okay? What would be the implications if a monopole did exist? So, yeah, it would be like a, it might be a pretty good piece of evidence for things like string theory or certain models of string theory. And again, it would mean our understanding of ENM needs to be revised. Yeah. Okay, so now you're ready to see all of Maxwell's equations all on the same page, okay? Here they are. Maxwell's equations, there are four of them. Two of them you've seen before, before even coming to this lecture. The first one is Gauss's law for electric fields, okay? This says that E dot dA integrated over some kind of closed surface is equal to the charge we're enclosing, which is Q enclosed, divided by epsilon naught. This is one of the first equations we saw in this class. So you remember using this to find the E field due to like a ring of, or a, a line of charge or a sphere of charge, things like that. So Gauss's law for E fields is one of these equations. Gauss's law for B fields, which I just showed you, which says the integral d dot dA over some closed surface is always zero, is another one of Maxwell's equations. Then we have Faraday's law. 
That's what we went over in the last chapter. Now, we're kind of used to writing this in a certain way. We think of it in terms of an EMF induced that causes some current to start flowing. But a more general way to write this is instead of saying the EMF or the voltage, we'll write that as E dot DL. Okay? This is just another way of saying the induced EMF. That's equal to minus DDT V dot DA, where this is our magnetic flux. So if we have a changing magnetic flux, that creates an EMF. That's Faraday's law. Okay? So I'm just showing it to you in a form where it just involves the E fields and the B fields. Okay? Then we have the Ampere Maxwell law. This says integral of V dot DL equals mu naught times I enclosed and then plus this correction term, which is epsilon naught times mu naught times d dt of e dot dA. So this is just the displacement current. I'm expanding it all out, okay? So we have four different equations. What do those four equations allow you to do? What they allow you to do is to calculate the E field, the electric field, or the magnetic field, the B field, at any point in space under any circumstances. So these are complete equations. You can literally calculate any E field or B field from these equations in theory. It's not always going to be easy to do that, right? Sometimes that is just like a giant problem in terms of the math. But all the information is in these equations. So it's kind of amazing. Everything you need to know about E fields and B fields can be just written on the palm of your hand, okay? It's all right there. Then there's just one other piece to it, okay? We can calculate any type of E field or B field given the right information. We also need to know, okay, if I put something inside of that E field or B field, how is it going to behave? That's where this equation comes in. Remember, this is this thing called the Lorentz force. It's basically the electric field exerts a force on a charge, and then so does a magnetic field. That exerts a force on a charge. So for the electric force, that's Q times E. And for the magnetic force, that's QV cross B. So if we put all this together, that is a complete theory of electricity and magnetism. Anything we know about ENM that I've shown you at any point in this semester could theoretically be derived just from this. Okay? Again, it's not always practical to do that. Sometimes we want to use some nice useful results, like V equals IR, for example. But in theory, it's all contained in these equations. Every single effect of ENM is in there. All right? That's the complete theory. So that's what Maxwell did. Some of this stuff he didn't come up with, right? But he put it all together into a complete theory. That's, that's what he did. He unified all these ideas into a complete theory. So do we have any questions on that? We should learn these first. We could just have everything to start. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you want to see this on the first day? <laughs> okay. I'll try that next time. See how that goes. After we're gone, of course. Okay, yeah. Not for you guys. We'll next semester. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll see, I'll see how that goes. All right. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you this. We're not really going to use this, but in case you take a class in ENM in the future, um, I just want you to be aware of this. Okay. What I showed you is Maxwell's equations in the so-called integral form. That means the equations involve integrals, okay? Every single of the four equations involves some type of integral. So, of course, you know, Gauss's law, E dot dA equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. We're integrating here, right? Same with, I don't know, Faraday's law. We're integrating on both sides. It turns out, just if you do a little bit of vector calculus, so if if you take calc 3, you'll learn how to kind of go from here to here. You can write these in so-called differential form. So instead of writing the equations in terms of integrals, they're written in terms of derivatives. Okay? And this thing uh, that you see here is called the gradient operator. We all heard of this before? Okay. So it's just a shorthand way of writing a derivative along each coordinate direction. So you can write them either way. We're going to stick to this form in this class because this form requires maybe some calc that you haven't seen before. Right? But you can switch between the two 
And if you take a more advanced ENM, you know, you'll learn how to switch between the two. Okay? So I'm just going to kind of skip ahead. Don't feel the need to write all that down. Just want you to be aware there's two different forms. Okay? All right. So I want to give you kind of a preview of something we're going to see and cover pretty much as much as we can next week. Okay? So we'll probably get to this starting on Monday and then spend all of Wednesday talking about this, which is we can now look at Maxwell's equations and try to understand how light works, okay? So again, the light that you see uh, fundamentally can be understood in terms of E fields and B fields, okay? So here's how this works. Let's start with Faraday's law. Faraday's law um, says that E dot DL integrated over some loop equals minus d dt, that's the time derivative of v dot dA. In other words, we have voltage on the left side, on the right side we have a change in magnetic flux. Okay? But that's how we just write it in terms of E fields and B fields. If you think about it, on the right side of Faraday's law, we have a time derivative in something involving B, right? On the left-hand side, we have something involving E. What you can, in a rough sense, think of that as saying is if you have a changing B field, which is the right side of the equation, that creates an E field. So a changing B field gives you an E field. Now let's look at the Ampere-Maxwell law. This has, on the left side of the equation, something involving the B field, okay? And on the right side, it has something involving a change in the E field. So what does that tell you? It tells you that a change in E field gives you a B field. Okay, so if one of the two types of fields we learned about is changing over time, it creates the other type of field. That's what both of these equations taken together is telling us. And there's some nice symmetry in those equations, right? Changing E field gives you a B field, changing B field gives you an E field. Let's take that to its logical conclusion, right? That can create sort of a self-perpetuating process. Let's say we have a B field that changes over time. That's our starting point. Okay, according to, um, yeah, according to Faraday's law, that's gonna produce an E field. Maybe that's changing over time as well, right? that's the case, according to the Ampere-Maxwell law, this changing E field is going to produce a changing B field. What's that going to be? That's going to produce a changing E field. Then this just can keep going, right? So um, I'm going to show you a sketch of this. Hopefully this will make it a little more clear. But this is a tough concept, so definitely stop me if you have any questions. Here, I'm going to give you an example of uh, like an antenna. Okay? This can be thought of as like a radio antenna, something that's broadcasting a radio signal. It's just a rod which has an oscillating current on it, okay? So think of this as like a metal rod with just current which is oscillating. Sometimes it's going up, then it's going down, then it's going back up. So it's alternating current on this rod sloshing up and down, okay? That's the picture. All right, so first of all, if I just have some current flowing this way, what type of field generically are we going to produce if we just have current? We, we produce a magnetic field, a B field, right? And what does that magnetic field look like, roughly speaking? It's a loop, right? So the magnetic field kind of loops around this current. So let's just show that to start. I'll call that B field, which just, maybe you think of it as like our original B field, it loops around this, this wire, okay? And uh, yeah, did we get the direction right? Yes, right hand rule says we got it right. Okay, but now I want you to imagine this. It's not just a direct current that just keeps going this way. Now we're gonna flip the current around, okay? So now imagine the current is going down. What does that do to our B field? Change the direction. Yeah. So you see, I flipped the current, so now it's going down, 
and now our B field changes directions. But the strength of that B field must have changed, right, to go from looping one way to looping the other way. In the process of the current flipping, the B field flips around. Now we have a changing B field. Changing B field gives you what? Gives you an E field, right? Specifically, how should we think about that E field? The B field lines kind of go through a surface like, like this, basically, right? You can think of the flux of lines as coming out of the page, more or less, in this picture. Okay? That means an E field is going to loop around that type of surface. So the E field that's created by this changing B field kind of loops around like this. I'm going to call that E naught. Okay? Now let's do the same thing. Let's flip the current once again. This current is sloshing back and forth. So we just showed one cycle. It's going to flip back up eventually, right? What's that going to do? Watch carefully. Now the current flips back up. What does that do? That flips the B field direction, and it flips this E field direction. And now this is a changing E field right here, right? What does a changing E field create? Now we have a B field, right? That B field you can show is going to loop around like this. Okay? Let's call that B1. All right? The current is still sloshing back and forth. That's not changed. So now we want to flip the current down once again, right? So flip the current down once again. Now all these field directions flip again. Now we have a changing B field right here. What's that give us? It gives us an E field, right? So let me get to your question, Devante. What was your question? Oh, you my question? Okay, yeah. So this this never stops. This keeps going. <laughs> all right. Current goes back up, all the field directions change again, and we get another V field. Okay, so what is this saying? We have charge that's oscillating up and down on this wire. It seems to be sending out some kind of wave, okay, from the source of oscillating E fields and V fields. That's what light is. I just showed you, in a nutshell, what light is. Now, it's not just the light we see that works this way, okay? This is probably a better illustration of like a radio wave. This is literally what a simple uh, radio transmitter might look like. You just run some current up and down, uh, alternating through a antenna that sends out this sort of wave. Um, so when I say light, I mean any type of electromagnetic wave. That's what this is called. It's a wave in the sense that it consists of oscillating E and B fields, and it's going somewhere. It's going away from the source. Okay. Uh, how do you get a unique signal? Is it like by the frequency of the alternation? Or yeah. The so we'll talk about that later. But the exactly. Let's say like for tuning into a radio station or something like that. Yeah. It's based on the frequency, but there is there. Are, it's not that simple. Um, you have FM and AM signals, for example, with terrestrial radio. The signal is contained in kind of changing the frequency in a subtle way for FM, and in AM you change the amplitude of the signal, and that, uh, that's how you transmit some sort of information through that wave. So do those numbers represent something? Like, I don't know if that's a dumb question, but... Which numbers? Do you change uh, like the stations on the radio? Yeah. That's called the, you're changing the frequency of the carrier signal okay. when you do that. So like, yeah, uh, in, in FM radio, it's in megahertz, like 93.5, let's say, K-day, right? Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's what it's referring to, is the frequency of this type of signal. <clears throat> okay, so that is just a preview. We're gonna go back to this, but from Maxwell's equations, particularly Faraday's law and the Ampere-Maxwell law taken together, we can see how you create what's called an electromagnetic wave. And all light, including the light you see with your eyes, is this, is an electromagnetic wave, okay? But it's more than that. It's also radio waves and X-rays and gamma rays and all sorts of things, okay? That's a preview. We're gonna take a sidetrack real quick into a different topic before we get to electromagnetic waves, okay? And that topic is energy in electric and magnetic fields. Okay, so 
This sidetrack is just so we can come up with some useful equations that describe energy stored in EMD fields. And some of this we've already seen before, okay? So, a little bit of derivation for you, okay? Has anyone heard of this type of object called an inductor in a circuit? An inductor is a common component in circuits, uh, much like a capacitor or a resistor. And this is what an inductor looks like. It's basically just a coil of wire wrapped around like in a cylindrical shape many, many times. So you might also know this as a solenoid, right? That's a familiar object, a solenoid. So let's consider a solenoid, which has some current running through it. But let's not just have that current be constant over time. Instead, let's have that current be something that's changing over time. Okay, so maybe the current is ramping up or ramping down, or maybe it's oscillating. It's changing in some way, okay? So first of all, here are some of the numbers uh, or the quantities that are going to go into our derivation. Okay, N, that's how many turns of wire we have in our solenoid, capital N. I, that's going to represent how much current is flowing through this wire. L, of course, is going to represent the total length of the solenoid from one side to the other. And then A is going to represent the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. So in other words, I'm showing you A right there. It's like a circular area uh, of our solenoid. And as for the B field, I showed you this when we went over solenoids two chapters ago. It just kind of goes along the barrel of the solenoid. So I'm showing you how the B field points, okay? We derived, by the way, what the B field strength is, and it is given by mu naught times I times the number of terms uh, in the solenoid per unit length. Okay? So all of this is stuff you've seen before. Okay, so if we have this kind of setup and a changing amount of current going through the solenoid, if I is changing, so is B. We'd agree? And if B is changing, that means we have a changing flux going through that surface that I drew right up there, correct? That's where Faraday's law is gonna kick in, right? If we have a changing magnetic flux, we induce a voltage or an EMF in the solenoid, okay? Let's just use Faraday's law real quick to calculate what that is. According to Faraday's law, and again, I'm gonna use the more familiar form of it right here, which is in terms of an induced EMF. This induced EMF is equal to N, the number of turns, times uh, the change in magnetic flux with respect to time. That's what this term is, okay? So the magnetic flux through that little circular surface that you see up there is nothing more than B, which is the strength of the B field going through the surface, times A, which is the area of the surface, okay? Just to kind of skip a step, that's what it works out to. And what can I pull out in this case? Like what, which of these two variables would be the constant? The A. Yeah, the A is changing, or A is not changing, but B is changing, right? The strength of the B field is changing if the current running through this thing is changing, right? So I'm gonna pull out A. So then we have N times A, and then DB, DT, all right? But in place of B, right, in place of the strength of the B field, I'm going to insert this expression. This applies to solenoids. Again, we derived this earlier. So what I have now is N times A times the derivative with respect to time of mu naught times I times N divided by L. Okay, so just subbing in our expression for B right there. Now, what can I pull out of the derivative? Mu naught and L. Yeah, mu naught is a constant, n is a constant, so is l. So all of that can come out, right? And then I'm just left with i. i is what is actually changing here, right? So, doing that, I have mu naught, and now I have n squared. I already had a factor of n out here, I have a second factor, that's n squared now. And then I have a, and then I'm dividing by l. And then, the only thing left to take the derivative of is i, so I have di dt right here, okay? 
So let's think about what this is saying. This is saying that we induce a voltage which is just a whole bunch of constants. Think of this as a whole bunch of constants times the IDT. So the way this thing works is, the inductor works, you induce a voltage in it because of a changing current. The faster your current is changing, the more of a voltage we induce. And by the way, this tends to oppose the change in current, if you remember Lenz's law. So that means an inductor is just a device which is opposing changes in current. The more of a change in current you have in your circuit, then the bigger the EMF you'll induce, which will oppose that change. That's, that's what's going on with an inductor. So there's this constant of proportionality out front, right? This mu naught times n squared times a divided by L. And I hope you can see that the bigger this whole constant out front is, the bigger our induced EMF will be, right? So for that reason, we call this thing the inductance of the solenoid, okay? It just tells you basically how good is your solenoid at, re at um, resisting changes in current, okay? So the name we give to this thing is capital L, it's called the inductance, okay? So we can now write this in a much simpler way, right? Just E, the EMF is just L times the IDT. Okay, so that takes us to some things I just said, but I'll repeat. An inductor is a current element, um, it's a circuit element, sorry, which um, resists change in the current, okay? So the, the formula for the voltage across an inductor, which we just derived, I'm going to write this as V, like the voltage across the inductor, equals L, that's our inductance, and remember that's this whole big set of constants from before, that's mu naught times n squared times A divided by the length, and then that constant is multiplied by the IDT. So if I want to know the voltage across an inductor, it's just the inductance L times the IDT. Okay, and that's the constant L that I showed you right there. Okay, so that's the voltage. Uh, we derived that using Faraday's law just now. If we apply Lenz's law to say, you know, what direction should this voltage be applied in? Um, it's basically going to oppose the change in current, okay? So this device called an inductor just resists changes in current. It opposes changes in current that are flowing through it. And on a circuit diagram, by the way, we use this symbol. So we have symbols for capacitors, resistors, and now inductors that we know how to use, okay? So that's an inductor. Um, let's do a real quick unit check. All right, we have this new quantity called inductance. It's kind of similar to resistance or capacitance, but applies to inductors. It has a unit in the SI system, which we call a Henry, okay? So real quick, we'll go through the unit analysis of what a Henry is. Starting from up here, okay? If I solve for L, inductance L, is some kind of voltage divided by the IDT. You can think of it that way. The inductance is a voltage divided by the derivative of the current with respect to time. Okay, um, voltage, what are the units? That should be very obvious. Volts, and then what's the unit for DIDT? Amps per second. Yeah, because I has units of amps, and then if we take the derivative of that, we divide by a unit of time, which is seconds. Okay, so the unit for inductance is a volt divided by an amp per second. Or if you want to clean that up a little, you can write that as a volt times a second divided by an amp. That's the definition of a Henry, which is our SI unit of inductance. Okay, so in practical terms, if you have a circuit and you have inductors in that circuit, uh, they're usually going to be rated at, you know, X number of Henry's. Okay, that's typically what we'll use. All right, questions on this? All right, so the last thing we'll do is I'm going to show you a formula for the energy stored in an inductor. Okay? 
We have this new circuit element we just learned about called an inductor. We use L to denote it. And we want to come up with a formula for the energy stored in that inductor. So just like a capacitor, if it has charge on it, can store some energy. An inductor, if it has some current running through it, can also store some energy. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that that energy, which we call U, is one-half times L times I squared. Okay? So we'll go through the derivation now. You guys remember this formula for power? So the power output of any device is given by I times V, where I is the current that runs through it, and V is the voltage across it, right? Well, if we're talking about an inductor, we know that the voltage across it, we just derived that, is L, the inductance, times di dt. Okay, we just showed that a second ago. So I'm replacing uh, L times di dt for the voltage. Okay? Now, do you guys remember just like, even before we learned that power can be thought of as I times V for some component of a circuit, what is a more basic general definition of power? Think about the units, right? A, what's a unit of um, power? It's a watt, right? Which is a joule per second. <clears throat> so it seems like power is some sort of energy over time type quantity, right? In other words, we can write the power as du dt. It's the energy coming into our inductor, du, per unit time, which is dt. Okay? So we can write the power in all these various different ways. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the last two ways that we wrote the power and just focus on that. So first of all, just looking at this equals that, what can I do to simplify? I can, I can integrate at some point, but I can also uh, get rid of the time dependence, cancel out dt, to give you this. du is just L times I times di, after canceling out the time dependence, okay? And yet, now at this point, we can integrate, right? Because du is some tiny amount of energy, um, but we want to integrate to get some sort of total energy stored, right? So here's how that's going to go. Integrate both sides of that equation. We have du, we're going to integrate that from zero to u. So in other words, from zero energy stored out to some final energy stored. On the other side, we're going to go from zero, no current going through the inductor, all the way out to I, which is whatever our final value of the current is. And what we're integrating on that side is L times I times di. I'm just putting little primes on that so we don't confuse the integration variable with the top limit, okay? So, if somebody tell me uh, on the right side, L is just a constant, so that can be pulled out. How does this thing integrate if I just have I? Yeah, that integrates to a half times I squared, right? If I have I to the first power, it's just a half I squared. So that means U is a half times this constant L times I squared. And that goes from zero to I, so that's just a half times Li squared minus zero. So we, we've proven the result, okay? The energy stored in an inductor is a half times L times I squared. Just depends on two factors, the inductance and the amount of current flowing through it, okay? So the thing we'll end with is this. You guys remember the idea of energy density? So capital U is just total energy stored. Lowercase u stands for energy density. Energy density is the energy per unit volume in some region of space. Okay? Energy divided by volume. That's what energy density means. So magnetic energy density is specifically for a magnetic field. How much energy is being stored? per unit volume, okay? So for that, I'm gonna remind you of something we already said. 
the B field inside of an inductor is equal to mu naught times I times N divided by L. Okay? That's the strength of the B field. What I'm going to do with that is rearrange to solve for I. Okay? When we do that, I'll take the L, put it right here next to the B, and divide by mu naught and N. So I have I equals B times L divided by mu naught times n. And then what I'll do with that, well actually, in a second, so that's the substitution I'm going to make for i, right here, okay? For the inductance l, we already worked out what that is, that's mu naught times n squared times a divided by l, okay? So I'm going to make both of those substitutions into this formula and then show you what the result is. So when we plug those both into the energy expression, here's what we get. I get a half, L is mu naught n squared times A divided by L. And then we have I squared, which is BL divided by mu naught times N, and we square that whole thing. It's kind of a mess, don't get me wrong. There's a lot going on there, but if we keep track of our terms carefully, you can see a lot of things start canceling, okay? Like first of all, um, what about my n term? I have an n squared up here, and when I square this quantity, I'm going to have an n squared on the bottom. So that just goes away altogether, right? Overall, how many L factors do I have? I have an L down here, I have an L squared up here, so I just have an L on top, right? I also have a factor of A on top. For my mu naught factors, I have a mu squared down here, I have a mu on top, so I just have one factor on the bottom, I think, right? So to put it all together, I have b squared from here, divided by 2 from here, divided by mu naught from collecting the terms, then multiplied by a times l. All right, does anyone recognize what this could be? a is the area of our inductor, and then l is the length of it. What is this? A times L is the volume of the space inside of our inductor. Okay? So A times L is the volume. So that suggests right away what the energy density should be, right? If this is the total energy, energy density is this, but divide out the volume. In other words, divide out A times L. So energy density, when it comes to a magnetic field, is just this with the volume divided out, which is b squared divided by 2 times mu naught. Okay? So we've derived a really important result. We've used an inductor as kind of our example to get to here, but this generally holds true. Whenever you have a B field, you have a corresponding energy density. Just like if you have an E field, you have a corresponding energy density. And um, I just want to remind you of what that was. We derived this in a previous chapter for electric energy density for E fields. We now have a corresponding magnetic energy density for B fields. So we're going to pick up right here on Monday of next week. That's it for today.